Good morning, everybody. It is a good morning. Dean Leonard, distinguished faculty, students, parents, family, and friends, it is my great honor to address you today. And to the moms in the room, happy Mother's Day. Is this not the best Mother's Day present you could possibly have? And students, I know that getting here was not easy. It took a lot of smarts, hard work, and late nights. You should be very proud of this impressive accomplishment. I am Attorney General Josh Stein, or as I'm probably better known to this class, the guy who works with Professor Matt Salchak. <laughs> Matt, as you likely know, is our state's new Solicitor General, and he is outstanding. I am lucky to have him, Campbell is lucky to have him, and the state of North Carolina is lucky to have Matt. Robert Montgomery, who heads the criminal division in the Department of Justice, also teaches here at Campbell Law School. Robert is another outstanding legal mind, and just two months ago at the United States Supreme Court, I saw him very effectively wrestle in front of the bench, challenging questions about sexual predators using online social networking sites that are available to young people. He did the state proud. I also worked with, closely with uh, one of your own a few years ago, Emily Massey, your law review editor, and I were colleagues on a project for the monitor of the National Mortgage Settlement. Emily, you're in there somewhere, I don't know where, congratulations, I am proud of you. A couple of years ago, as, as Rich said, uh, I was uh, an adjunct faculty member here at Campbell as well, but after a couple of years, I realized that running for office and teaching were not effective complements. Uh, I had to give one up, and I, I unfortunately had to sacrifice this. But when Dean Leonard invited me to speak today, I was excited to be taken off the bench, put back into the game, even if it's just for one play. From my perspective, this is great. A commencement speech offers me the opportunity to impart ideas to inquiring law student minds without a semester's worth of preparation or having to grade papers. From your perspective, a commencement speech is a lot like a class lesson. You listen to a lecture, you get advice, and you hope that it doesn't last too long. I can at least guarantee you the first two things. <laughs> it's been a while since I sat where you do now. Uh, honestly, I had to think hard before I remembered who my law school class, my law school commencement speech was, let alone what his message was. So if down the road you don't recollect what I say today, hopefully you'll remember it was me. And my name is Stein, S-T-E-I-N. <laughs> what is clear in my mind 22 years later is that the graduation represented a major turning point in my life. Finally, no longer a student, I would now instead try to make my mark professionally. I found out quickly that law school is very different than the practice of law. In law school, I learned a lot of legal theory. Since I hadn't done any clinical work as a student, the human element was lacking. There were, the issues were abstract. In practice, however, real people are going to depend on you. They will come to you, maybe down on their luck, sometimes without much hope, at other times, with an important principle or a lot of money at stake. They'll turn to you, someone they may not know, for help, and it is your job to help them as zealously and effectively as you can. Fortunately, Campbell Law School has prepared you for that. You were taught from day one about how to use the law to help others. It is spelled out in Campbell Law School's vision. To help to develop lawyers who possess moral conviction, social compassion, and professional competence who view the practice of law as a calling to serve others and create a more just society. Today I want to talk a little more about just that, your responsibility to serve others and create a more just society. Being an attorney is more than just a job. It's a profession with ethics and responsibilities. As an attorney, you are an officer of the court whose duty it is to seek justice and protect the rule of law. When you get sworn in before the bench, you will take an oath in which you swear the following. I do solemnly and sincerely swear that I will be faithful and bear true allegiance to the state of North Carolina and the constitutional powers and authorities which are or may be established for the government thereof, 
and that I will endeavor to support, maintain, and defend the Constitution of said state, not inconsistent with the Constitution of the United States, to the best of my knowledge and ability, so help me God. Many other careers are ennobling. Being a teacher shapes minds. Being an artist expresses the human spirit. Being an entrepreneur creates wealth and strengthens the economy. But those folks do not stand before a judge, put their hand on the Bible, and swear to defend the Constitution of the United States. Those folks are not obligated to defend the processes and rules that ensure that justice is blind and that no one is above the law. Lawyers do. You soon will. As a result, you will have a special duty to stand up when the Constitution and the democratic norms and institutions that give it meaning are undermined or threatened. So doing this is one way to fulfill your part of the Campbell Law School mission to serve others and create a more just society. Today, I want to talk to you about three important areas that are all essential elements of our constitutional government, three principles that I believe lawyers must defend when they are under attack. They are an independent judiciary, a free press, and free and fair elections. By fighting for these principles, we demonstrate a respect for our democracy itself. When these tenants are threatened, they need defending. That defense is the job of a lawyer. Understand I am not talking about particular policy issues, such as health care or trade or foreign policy. People of goodwill can and do have difference of opinions on these issues. Nor am I talking about partisan politics. I am talking about the respect for the rule of law, the foundation on which our profession and nation are built. Defending the rule of law is not Democratic or Republican. It is American, and I believe that it is your duty. To those of you who study with Matt or Robert, did they ever show you all any schoolhouse rock videos in their classes? Probably not. Uh, you may be too young to even know what they are. Just ask David Wyatt, your classmate and my contemporary. <laughs> he knows what they are. If you don't know what they are, check them out on YouTube. Uh, back when I was growing up, Schoolhouse Rock were great cartoons that would come on TV Saturday morning during the uh, cartoons to educate us kids. There were ones about how a bill becomes a law, multiplication tables, grammar, things like that. And there was one called the Three Ring Government which first introduced me to the concept of the separation of powers, and it was almost as informative as the Federalist Papers. <laughs> Hamilton and Madison created three separate branches of government, the legislative, executive, and judiciary, in our Constitution so that they would keep the others in check. Why is that necessary? Condoleezza Rice, the former Secretary of State and National Security Advisor to George w, President George W. Bush, recently said, what the Founding Fathers understood was that institutions were built for human imperfection, not human perfection. So, to keep power diffuse, to counter human frailty, to protect against tyranny, our Constitution ensures that no one branch has too much power. The lines that separate the branches, however, are not always clear. The tensions between them are common. It is the role of the judiciary to resolve those tensions. It is also the role of the judiciary to check the executive and legislative branches when they intrude on another branch's powers and when they intrude on our personal liberties as articulated in our Constitution. When courts make these determinations, the American way is for public officials to accept the court's rulings even when they violently disagree with them. We saw this when Al Gore immediately and emphatically conceded the 2000 presidential election to George Bush after the Supreme Court published its decision. More recently, however, we have seen the executive and legislative branches, both at the federal and state levels, seek to undermine the independence and legitimacy of our judiciary. We've seen the executive branch of the federal government challenges, challenge the judiciary's authority to provide the very checks and balances it was created to deliver. We've seen leaders question the ability of a judge to perform his constitutional duties 
based on the ethnic heritage of his predecessors, his forebears, or another judge based on the fact that his state is an island. We've seen lawmakers in Kansas threaten to defund the state Supreme Court if it did not uphold a law that took certain powers from the court and gave them to the legislature. I understand that we live in hyperpartisan times, but this undermining of the judiciary is bigger than politics. It erodes people's respect for the rule of law that makes America what it is. If unchecked, this ultimately will undermine the health and vitality of our democracy and ultimately the nation itself. Without an independent judiciary, who is left to protect our personal liberties from an overreaching executive or a power-grabbing legislature? When democratically elected bodies passed unconstitutional Jim Crow laws here in North Carolina and other southern states, our independent judiciary eventually righted these wrongs in response to arguments made by attorneys like you. Whose job is it to defend the judiciary from unfounded attacks? It is yours, the graduating class of 2017. You now have the special knowledge and understanding of how important the legal system and its processes w are, which imposes on you a special obligation to defend that system from attack. Our Constitution not only establishes an independent judiciary as a check on the other branches of government, the First Amendment to the Constitution declares that there shall be freedom of the press to hold our government and elected officials accountable. Recently, a federal judge wrote, quote, democracies die behind closed doors. Recently, both the Washington Post and New York Times have adopted slogans with variations of that phrase. Unlike any other time in our lifetimes, politicians are attacking our free press when coverage has not been to their liking. Now, a politician who doesn't like unflattering news stories is nothing new, and you can trust me on that. The feeling is not all that different from what you will experience at some point in your career when an opinion goes against your client and you are convinced that the court got it wrong. But just as we must not impugn judges who rule against us, we must refrain from open hostility and coarse insults of the media no matter how wrong we think they are. Without a free press to inform the public, how are we to know when an executive is undermining our civil liberties or violating the law or when a legislature is steamrolling our system of checks and balances or mischaracterizing reality. If damaging or improper actions remain hidden from public view or the news coverage is manipulated, the voters will be ignorant, unable to hold their government accountable. The media provides us information serving an essential function in our democracy. When the media is being lambasted unfairly, who must defend it? It is you, the graduating class of 2017. I've discussed your duty to defend the judiciary and press from unfair attacks. It should go without saying that you also have a duty to defend democracy itself. The right to vote is our most fundamental right. Voting is how we, the people, express our preferences and hold our elected officials accountable. For our system to work, the citizenry must have faith in the administration of our elections and their outcomes. That our nation has peacefully transferred power from one party to another dozens of times over the last 233 years is one of our nation's most miraculous accomplishments. No other nation in the history of the world can make that claim. We've achieved this because the voters, especially those on the losing side in a tight election, respect the validity of the outcome. When people do not believe the results of an election actually reflects the popular will, as what occurs in unstable democracies around the world, the losing side protests as a matter of course, and those in power further distort the system to maintain that power. To maintain people's faith in our system, we must rigorously and regularly review how we administer elections and continually make improvements to the process. Only valid voters should vote, and our elections should operate as smoothly and conveniently as possible. But this effort of continuous improvement is different than asserting that the outcomes of an election is dubious because one doesn't like the outcome. 
just after you lose a case, as you inevitably will, you should seek to learn from your mistakes and work harder on the appeal or the next case. Politicians similarly and political parties who lose an election must accept defeat and work harder to convince more voters in the next race. In recent years, however, the repeated unsubstantiated claims of voter fraud represent more than just sour grapes. They serve to undermine people's faith in the fundamental process on which our democracy is based, free and fair elections. For someone to assert without a scintilla of evidence that millions of people voted illegally in the presidential election is reckless. For someone else uh, to assert again without evidence that hundreds of eligible lawful voters cast illegal votes in our state is also reckless. These charges only serve to weaken people's faith in the validity of our elections. So when unsubstantiated allegations of voter fraud are leveled, whose job is it to defend our democracy? It is yours, the graduating class of 2017. You've indicated to your friends, family, and community that you believe in our legal system and the way that it guides our society, so much so that you spent three years studying the law and will soon launch a career in it. As lawyers, selfishly, our livelihoods depend on healthy legal and political systems and the respect for the rule of law. That means you have a special responsibility to defend our legal and political systems when they are undermined. It is a big responsibility and it is thrust upon you even if your field of practice doesn't lead you into the, any of these areas professionally. Each of you leaves here today armed with skills of critical thinking, persuasion, effective communication, and hard work. Put those skills to broad use. As a lawyer, you will become a leader in your community. Folks will come up to you at church, at parties, in your civic clubs, at your kids' soccer games, and ask you what you think about the news of the day. I surely hope that you will embrace this leadership role and share your views. And when you're in doubt, let your oath to the Constitution serve as a touchstone. You uphold your oath by opposing efforts to intimidate an independent judiciary. You uphold your oath by defending the rights of oppressed to inform the public so that those in power can be held accountable. You uphold your oath by voting and speaking out when leaders cast baseless aspersions about our elections or erect impediments to voting. You uphold your oath when you stand up for the rule of law and fortify our democracy. Now let me close with some practical advice from one lawyer to others. First, I highly, highly recommend that you don't wait until two weeks before the bar to start studying in earnest. You can trust me on that. Second, don't worry if you're not sure about what you're going to do next. No matter what job you do, you will learn a great deal about yourself, what you like and what you don't what you're good at and what you're not. When you seek your second job, as you almost certainly will, you'll have a better sense of what's right for you. And finally, have fun. Make time for family and friends. You're going to have serious jobs. You will work hard. I encourage you to earn enough money to provide for yourselves and your families. But keep things in perspective. Good buddies and justices, Ruth Bader Ginsburg and the late Antonin Scalia, enjoyed going to the opera together. Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, two people who certainly would be characterized as busy, still find time to play online bridge together. For me, it's watching my kids play lacrosse, cheering for Carolina basketball, and walking the dogs with my wife. Make time for the activities that will bring you happiness, especially with those you love. Graduates of the class of 2017, Campbell Law School has prepared you well for what's next. I'm confident that you will find ways to enjoy your career as you fulfill Campbell's mission by serving others and creating a more just society. Good luck and hearty congratulations.